refers, uh, it refers to your preaching career. You're going to have disappointments. You're going to have ups and downs. And so you want to do everything you, you can to equip yourself, not only spiritually, but with tools that are going to help you to preach better. And I'm a firm believer in filing. I was, I was uh, encouraged when I was still in school. Get a good filing system, start filing, keeping your information in order. And it'll pay rich dividends in the years to come. But as I went about setting up various filing systems and doing things for, for filing, uh, I started to realize that it's more than just filing in many instances. Actually, the arrangement of your office, how you, how you view your office. Uh, there's an article in here by Brother Wendell Linkler called The Preacher's Private Life. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are some of these that uh, I do want to at least call your attention to. This should be about the third page down. This uh, was on the Christian Courier website. And, uh, Brother Wendell Linkler, I was privileged to have him as my homiletic teacher at Brown Trail. He was, a, he was a master at organization. He gave us a lot of suggestions in the pre-digital age that eventually when we moved into the digital age, uh, we began to see how some of those principles could apply to a filing system. Uh, he gives several suggestions with regard to the preacher and the study. Uh, you're going to have to maintain proper study habits. Uh, these were things at least the second year students, that they're getting close to graduation, that you've probably been told over and over again. Now, you can take your study habits that you develop here and incorporate that into your local work, and you keep your study habits in place. I'm not suggesting that you have to go to school, I mean, have to be in your study eight to ten hours a day and then another six or seven hours at night. But the late Gus Nickel uh, often commented that he spent six hours, six to eight hours per day studying God's Word. And I read one little increment in his life that as he was, as he was plowing behind a, a mocking or a mule and a plow, as he could get to the end of a row and that started making that turn, he'd take his pocket Bible out and he'd look at a passage, fix it in his mind, and he'd start down the other row and he would repeat that over and over and over again and he got to the end of the other road by then he had it memorized. So he utilized every moment uh, in study and memorization of Scripture, uh, no doubt going over his mind <coughs> in regard to uh, organization or whatever sermon it, it is that he was going to preach. Uh, and you're the fact that we're only going to have about two and a half hours. A lot of this I'm going to skip, but I, I hope that you'll take the time to go back and study some of those a little bit more in detail. Uh, their preparation to preaching involves book knowledge. And when we say book knowledge, we're talking about not just the Bible. That's at the top of the list, obviously. But you need to be an avid reader of books because if you don't read books and get a wide range of what's out there and the information that's available, you'll rob yourself of so much valuable tools, so many valuable tools that could be yours. Uh, Brother Winford Clark, I'm sorry, Brother uh, Winford Claiborne, uh, was an avid reader, and he must have been a speed reader because uh, he would read about 20, 10 to 20 books per month, and he could digest that in a remarkable way. I, I've never even come close to that. But if you're going to read any amount of material, you need to learn how to read faster than the normal person reads. normal person reads something like 200 words, 150 to 200 words per minute. And there are multitudes of speed reading courses out there. You need to utilize some of those. Try to increase the speed by which you can read. Preparation for preaching obviously involves dedication, does it not? And your dedication is being tested while you're in school. How committed are you to following through in your studies? And then when you get out into the workaday world, so to speak, you're going to have to make sure you maintain that dedication. Stick to itiveness. I don't know if there's such a word as that because <laughs> um, I've heard it, but it, simply the idea is you need to maintain your allegiance to a study of God's Word. You need to make sure that you keep on studying uh, even after your, uh, 
even after you're out of school. There's another article in here called, uh, I think it's actually the second page, it came before the last article, 20 ways, 20 ways to <coughs> prepare for a lifetime of preaching. And, uh, this author has several good suggestions. I want to just pick up two or three of these just to give you the flavor of what's in there because I'm going to watch my time real close so we'll have the proper amount of time needed to de deal with filing. He lists some of these. Concent Number one, concentrate on learning how to preach 90 sermons each year to the same people. It is a work of art to do so. And when you, when you start preaching and you've preached for 10, 15 years, the amount of material that you're going to cover will be the equivalent of at least one, perhaps even two novels per year. Two six or seven hundred page novels. So you're going to be doing an incredible amount of work and you need to use variety in, uh, in preaching. Number two, avoid references to people you have known at previous congregations. Your people are going to be enough, but sometimes you can use illustrations from uh, what you've had in past experiences. Number three, when you enter the pulpit to preach, preach. Preach the Word of God. Saturate your lessons with Scripture. Let God do the speaking, but make sure that you're not there as a, as a, a social mediator you're not there some kind of of an entertainment organizer you're not there to entertain people on Sunday morning you're there to preach and please don't ever lose sight of that number four speak often in public of your home Bible studies that will encourage people to be more evangelistic in their zeal talk about the success of what you're having in home Bible studies and share that with others number five avoid any temptations to gossip it, don't ever talk bad about the brethren. Now, sometimes you'll have to deal with issues. You'll have to mark false teachers. But you do that in a loving way, in a very careful, loving way. So make sure you stick to it. So 20 ways to prepare for a lifetime of preaching. I hope you'll take the time to read that. Let's talk about the preacher in his office for a minute. The office is more than just a place to sit down and open up your books and study. And you're going to, if you haven't already been informed of that, I think you're going to learn that it's a place that is quiet, at least it ought to be. And you need to do everything that you can. If the church doesn't provide you with an office, you try to put a place in your house somewhere. Build a little room or get off to a corner, but make that your place of study, a place that is quiet that is, uh, there's no distractions. Don't keep things in there that will distract you from your study. It needs to be comfortable, but not too comfortable. There's nothing wrong with having a comfortable chair to sit in. And uh, sometimes an old hardback kitchen chair and a small little table is all you'll have. My first work when I moved there, they had a janitor's closet that they had cleaned out to give me as my study. And literally, it wasn't, it wasn't any bigger and about this right here, that's all there was. And they gave me a little table, little, almost like a card table, and one little hardback chair to sit in to study and one little shelf for books. Now that held my books while I was there, but as books increase, obviously you're going to need more room. You need a place that is organized, uncluttered, and <coughs> conducive to good study. Uh, if you start bringing things into your study that are distractive, things that you don't use, things that take up space, particularly if you don't have a lot of space, uh, your office will become cluttered and your desk will be cluttered. And when you have a cluttered desk, it's a sign of a cluttered mind. In some cases, not always. Roy Deaver was one of the best Bible students I ever knew. He was... Uh, uh, he was a scholar in Greek. He memorized large portions of the Bible. But when I walked in to visit him on one occasion, there were so many things piled on his desk. He sat behind the desk. I sat here to talk to him. And literally, we had to move stacks of paper out of the way so that I could see him. So even though in that case, his desk was cluttered, and to some respect, even his office was cluttered, uh, it was still very organized, and he could put his hands on things in a most remarkable way. I think he had a photogenic memory. It's a place for counseling as well. And I try to advise preachers, if you're going to do counseling, it is a secondary 
aspect of your preaching. If you want to be a counselor, be a counselor. And do a little preaching on the side. If you're going to be a full-time preacher, be a full-time preacher. But there have been a lot of harm that's been done from preachers who try to do counseling who aren't qualified to do counseling. And don't be afraid to tell people I'm not qualified to do counseling. You can refer them to those who are qualified. And uh, even if they have to drive a certain distance, uh, you can put them in touch with a good Christian counselor. Caution should be exercised when you do counseling. By this I simply mean, particularly if you're counseling with the opposite sex, you keep somebody outside the office door at all times. My wife used to always come to the building with me. No matter what the hour of night, we'd get a babysitter and she'd come to the building with me and she'd sit right outside the door when I was counseling someone of the opposite sex. By the same token, when you sit down to counsel someone of the opposite sex, you stay on your side of the desk, you keep that person on the other side of the desk. You can pass tissue if they get into a weeping spell, but you don't get up and try to comfort them by embracing them. Exercise caution in counseling. And always remember this, counseling is confidential. You don't tell others what you're counseling about. You don't tell what the other person's problems is. You keep the confidentiality as it should be. And don't be afraid to defer those seeking help to professional counselors. But the office is a place for counseling. And in that sense, you would want to have at least one comfortable chair there where those who come in could sit down. I'm going to talk about the library more a little bit and file cabinets. File cabinets are those, well, they're multicolored. I used to say they're, they're those large gray boxes that collect papers that nobody knows what to do with after they get papers into the file cabinet. I can tell you about a preacher, or if I were to tell you about him, you probably know who I'm talking about. He does live west of the Mississippi, but he's a full-time preacher. And he has six cabinets, six filing cabinets filled with paper. No, no segments, no division whatsoever. They're just stuffed in the cabinets. And I asked him, I said, can you, can you find anything? He said, I have no idea what's in there. Except for the last two or three months maybe that I put into a new drawer. And he said, it's useless to me. That's six file cabinets of trash is what it is. And you can run into the same problem with computer documents. If you put them all in one place, like in your My Documents, you put everything into My Documents, that's going to pile up, and pretty soon you're going to be searching, 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 and never know how to find anything. And the value of filing, we're going to stress in, as we move through this little seminar, the study is a place of refuge. It's a place of escape for you. It's a place of prayer. And don't neglect that. You spend time by yourself in that study. And if you're blessed to have a good secretary, uh, you go into the office, you tell her on some occasions, I'm going to be busy for the next hour, no phone calls, please, no visits, I'll call in back. And you get in there and lock the door, and you spend time in prayer and meditation. I want you to look at this little article that I passed out because I think this is a this is a great little article. It was a single sheet, not with the packet. And I want to look at this little item on the left hand side. We can't emphasize enough when you get out of school and you get into your full time preaching work. You need to spend time in serious study. Let me just read this, if you will. Mention was made in chapter 1 of the special room which my father added to our house to make the preachers who stayed with us more comfortable. Mention was also made of the fact that this room played an important part in my life as a preacher. In the spring of 1928, as the school year at David Lipscomb College came to a close, I had three meetings booked for that summer but I had only three sermons. And during the winter, I had been filling in for the older preacher boys at various places. I had used three sermons all winter. And when school closed, it was three weeks before my first meeting. When I reached home, I holed up. That simply means he got in there and locked the door is what he did. I holed up in the preacher's room with my Bible and my books and set about to prepare a series of sermons for my summer's work. The principal books which I used in addition to the Bible were McGarvey's Sermons, Questions and Answers by Lipscomb and Sewell, A Concordance and a Dictionary. Aren't we blessed to have the age of computers? 
where you can up the click of a button get online and you can access more information than you can ever get to but that's what he had when he went into that room i came out of the room only long enough for my meals each day for three weeks there was talk among members of the family as to whether or not i was losing my mind it was hard work but when the three weeks were over i felt that i was loaded for bear now listen to this next point that he makes it was in that room that I began a study habit which I have kept till this day. That is, I set before myself a definite course of study and pursued it to the end with the same regularity and diligence as if I were attending school. Now, again, you're not going to have the time with all the preacher responsibilities to get into your work and just to spend it all in the books. That's, that's not what you're there for. You are now entering into the work field where your responsibility is to relate with people. You relate with people by getting out of the office. So you've got to strike a balance between the amount of time you spend in study and the amount of time that you spend in social activities, visiting the sick, visiting prospective students of the Bible, people you can study with. And brethren, unfortunately, I don't believe they, they grasp how important your study time is. Make that clear when you apply. I need six hours a day, five days a week to be in my office studying. And uh, that's mandatory. I had an eldership after I'd been there two years. I spent about six hours a day in my office, seven o'clock in the morning till noon, and then I'd come back in the afternoon, maybe late in the afternoon, to do some studying and filing. They thought I needed to be out in the city among in the community and so they came in they said we want you to start tomorrow we want you to visit every business in town and drink coffee with them this was a town of about 40,000 and said we want you to drink coffee with them I said that's fine I said when am I supposed to get my study well come in for an hour and then get out and visit I said okay I'll do that if you'll go with me to every business I go to none of them volunteered to go with me but then I made this point. I said, brethren, you don't produce good sermons by an hour in study once a day. You just don't do it. And so uh, even though you're there to escape, you spend time in prayer, spend time in study, there's such a great role. All of these, uh, if you have an office at the church building, you're blessed. If you have an office at home, you're doubly blessed if you have both of them and uh, places to study God's Word and to meditate. Preacher in his office. Let's talk about his library for a minute. There are several things in a preacher's library. Obviously, there ought to be a Bible. In fact, there ought to be multitudes of Bibles. I've worn out I don't know how many Bibles. Some of you have been in my office, and you see I have a whole section on my bookshelf of used-up Bibles. I hate to throw Bibles away. I've never thrown a Bible away. I'll take and break it down, put it into a notebook. I'll fold it up and carry pages in my pocket. But I don't throw Bibles away. But the importance of spending time in this one book cannot be overemphasized. Uh, as one brother used to say, it's amazing how much light the Bible will shed upon commentaries. And that's true. So study the one book and... I wish I had the time to just give you some suggestions on study time. But let me, let me focus on this right here, uh, this second one, some suggested study schedules and approaches. I found it useful over the years, to every day, every week at the beginning, on Monday, run off a schedule of when I'm going to study. And I just block out the time, and I say, that's my study time. And some of the things I do with regard just to personal Bible study, not preparing for sermons, I'm not preparing for Wednesday night class, just my own study. I keep track of going through the New Testament and the Old Testament, not just reading, but studying. And I try to study, read a commentary on the Old Testament, every book in the Old Testament once every five years. On the New Testament, and I say this, I, I was given this suggestion by... Brother Robert Taylor, I don't have my little New Testament with me. My little New Testament has hundred and has two hundred and eighty-eight pages. My American Standard little has two hundred and eighty-eight pages. If I read ten pages a day, I'll read through the New Testament in twenty-nine days. Well, twenty-eight point 
eighth of April, whatever. But you get the idea. I started that in 1974 at Brother Taylor's suggestion. I felt I fell short of that the first two years. I only read through ten times. But every year since then, since 1976, I've been through the New Testament once every month. That mounts up. And what it does, if you use a Bible with the same pagination, I bought several copies of the American Standard. That means you're going to learn as you're reading, you're going to learn where things are in relation to other things. You'll make notes in the margin of your Bible. And more than anything else, it will get you through the whole New Testament once every month. You will be exposed to Scripture. And that one thing, in my estimation, has helped me in my Bible knowledge. Commentaries have been helpful, but reading the Bible, some suggested studies, read through the New Testament once a month, engage in your own private personal study in addition to Sermon preparation. If all you, if the only study you do is to prepare sermons, you're going to come up short. For one reason, you're going to come up short of information to build sermons out of. Sermons come out of a study of the Bible. When you saturate yourself with a knowledge of the Bible, and if you ever are fortunate enough or have the desire to do some writing, people ask me, how do you come up with so many articles every week? Every couple of weeks. It is because as I'm studying, things pop into my mind that I want to elaborate on. And I write, put them into my commentary notes, and I send them out if I think they'll be useful. So the Bible, books are an essential part. Good books, reliable commentaries, resource material, dictionaries, atlases, Greek study tools, denominational material. Don't, don't be fearful of reading and studying denominational material. It'll help you to see their error. And then pretend like you're, imagine if you will, you're preparing for a debate to answer that. And scribble little arguments in those denominational books. Debate books are a great value. I have probably 25, 30, maybe more than that debate books, and every one of them have been a great aid to me in, in seeing error, error. Sign up for periodicals. There are an abundance of periodicals that are free out there. You get some every week. Some of these are not free, but you get they're provided by the school. But uh, saturate yourself with some good periodicals. The uh, Gospel Journal, the Christian Courier, um, something like this one, Seeking the Old Path. This is Brother uh, Darwin Robinson's material. Uh, Brother Wenton, Bob Wenton has a, an online material. But read good periodicals because it'll, it'll help you keep up with issues in the church. It'll help you to expand your knowledge, write personal study notes. There's a lot of power in accumulation. And as you write and study, you put these into your notes. I try to study Matthew every year a little bit, Mark a little bit every year. Sometimes I'll spend more time on one book than I do the other. But I've been writing material for 45 years, going on 48, in fact. And a little bit every day accumulates. There's great value in electronic books. There, there's benefits to them. There's drawbacks to them. I like to hold a good book in my hand. Some people are really keen to getting on the computer. The older you get, the more difficult it's going to be to focus on that computer just because your eyes are going to grow over. Sometimes even books are that way. But the, the, the digital age is an amazing boon to the access of knowledge. And uh, For example, you can get commentaries, lectureship books. A lot of the books that I have in my library, I've also got in digital format for when I travel. Get yourself some good Bible sword software. I mean, some good uh, Bible software. eSword is a good one. I used eSword for years, found it very profitable. TheWord.net is another free. This is the one that I use, and I think it runs circles around eSword. But we could spend uh, quite some time talking about the benefit of the various, uh, uh, various um, software. Logos is a very expensive software. I'm not trying to discount Logos. If you'd like to spend the money on software, that thing's expensive. But don't just buy something because you think if it's expensive, it's got to be better. Sometimes the inexpensive or even the free will do everything that you want to do. So use a little stewardship in that, okay? Periodicals, personal study material, 
a source for sermon ideas. These are things that you need to be have in, in your library access to. File cabinets. Uh, we'll talk about file cabinets a little bit more as we get into actually talking about the filing system. Over the course of many years of study, you're going to collect mountains of material. Mount, I mean literally mountains of material. This is one drawer that I've got out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven drawers now filled with stuff. And uh, I've, I've cataloged all of the stuff. Every, every page is cataloged for future use. And uh, I'll talk about the value of just throwing it in a file cabinet and digitize it in a system in a minute. But you're going to have to come up with some way to, to Put these things where you can get your hands on. What value is a great article if once you've read it, you say, man, that's great. I'm going to stick it over here in this cabinet somewhere. I'll get to it. But you're not going to remember where it is. You'll remember an article or a quote. And then years down the road, if you have a good filing system, you're going to forget what you filed. And you're going to be doing a search on grace. Show me something on grace, some quotes that I have on grace. And you're going to pull up quotes you don't even remember reading. Illustrations you didn't even know you filed away. Sermon ideas that you'd completely forgotten. I have 13,000 sermon seeds in my database. I'll never get to them. I never will. But I, they're there. And they're, they're useful. So the purpose of filing is to organize, but it's also to be able to retrieve out of that filing system what's there and to retrieve it in such a way that you don't get discouraged. When I first started preaching, I had the old tabs. Here's a tab on uh, archaeology. Here's a tab on the church. Here's a tab on grace. My, my file on the church was that thick. In fact, I had two of them about that thick. Now, what if I remember, okay, somewhere in there, I put an article on the church by B.J. Clark. And what do I have to do now? I pull that thick file out. I'm going through a page at a time looking for this. And then if I don't find it, I probably misfiled it somewhere. So uh, the purpose of filing is, is for retrieval as well. You, in, a, in digital filing systems, you can file by subject. You can file by the books of the Bible. You can file by author. You can file by title. And then you can do a search. Show me everything I have by Tom Warren on the subject of authority, and it'll return everything for you. You file personal information, you loose bulletins. These go into file cabinets, whether we're talking about a physical file cabinet like this, or whether we're talking about a, um, whether we're talking about a, a digital file cabinet. Uh, some of this I'm just going to go through. Desk, desk and study space. Don't be like this fellow right here. Uh, now, I don't, uh, surely this is not, I got this off the internet. But I knew a preacher, his office looked just like this. I mean, literally, he had lanterns hanging on the wall and, and stuff that he had used in hunting, fishing poles laying over here. Uh, you're never going to be able to organize if it looks like that. Here's another one. I visited an IRA IRS agent one time. His office looked just like this, but it was smaller. A little computer geek fell up in Oklahoma City. I went up and had to talk to him about whether or not I'd done my tax forms right. How he, how he ever, how does anybody find anything in that? Well, you don't. Clutter or clear. Strike a happy medium in there. No, no problem with leaving things out on your desk when you're studying. But regularly, every week, go through and put things away so that you can retrieve them later. You need to think about the location of your desk and your chairs. I suggest you, when you put your desk in, if possible, if the room's big enough, keep it so that you can just turn around very quickly and get access to major re re reference books. Because if you have to get up and walk around just constantly moving, it cuts into your time for study. It may not be much, but every little bit helps. Preacher and his use of time, value of time. It's several things in here that I've given to you that have to do with time. There's one of these I really want to share with you. It's the one that's written by Frank Chester. And if you've ever read any of Frank Chester's material, uh, he is a master 
words. And he's always he's always amazing. Frank Chester time. Read this with me. And out of the bosom of eternity came time. God inhabiteth eternity while man dwells in time. Eternity gave birth to time as a temporary arrangement for transient humanity. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It's Peter's way of saying that time means nothing to God. In the beginning marks the commencement of time, the universe and man. At time's inception, there was no backward look, for back to time is eternity. Everything material is limited by time, as is time itself, for time's final sunset was planned in eternity. Man's body, skip down to the next couple of paragraphs. Man's body is born of time, his spirit for eternity. The moment he enters the door marked life, he commences a hasty exit toward the door marked death. His days on earth pass with more swiftness than a weaver's shovel, a fleeting, a fleeing shadow, or a dissipating vapor. Time marks him at birth and claims him at death. Time rushes on, unchecked, unaltered, carrying every material object to its inevitable end. Rust, decay, and death are its perpetual companions. We are all running out of time. And the only thing that really matters is, are you prepared to meet God? Are the books of your life balanced? Are you ready to go? When time is swallowed up in eternity, where will you be? Well, the point, the point being, and I think when the inspired writers talk about time on those occasions when they do, is to impress upon our mind how fleeting time is. And I look into the faces of some of you who are fresh out of high school, maybe out of college, and I can tell you time goes by so rapidly. I mean, it's, it's just like that and it's gone. Utilize your time. And bringing that down to a more, uh, to, to, the, to the application in this, you're going to have a Sunday every sermon, and it's, that time's going to get around. You're going to find yourself on Saturday night wondering what you're going to preach on. Pace yourself. Start early Monday, if not even before that, determining what you're going to preach on. Value of time. Sermon preparation. Good sermon and preparation involves time. Uh, there's an article in there, what is a preacher supposed to do? <laughs> it's amazing what people think of a preacher, what he's supposed to do. And a lot of people think he ought to be out visiting 60, 70% of his time. But I hope you'll take a look at that. How many hours should a preacher spend in study? You've got to strike a balance on this. And uh, I don't think you can do it any less than four hours a day of study. In fact, you're pressing it to get it in in four hours a day. Six to eight hours, you may be four or five hours in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, and maybe an hour at night. You'll get a good eight-hour study in. And that'll increase. You'll find yourself wanting to spend more time in study. Personal, his use of his time involves personal study other than just sermon or class preparation. You enhance your spiritual growth with personal study. And it also helps you to prepare for more sermons. So set up a schedule and stick to it. Take notes. Uh, make sure you do spend time in visiting and counseling. But make sure you get into that study. Let's talk about technology. Computers are just not practical for a preacher. That statement was made August the 15th, 1988. You know who made that statement? I did. <laughs> well, my son was in high school about to head off to Freed Hardeman, and he said, Daddy, you need to get into the computer age. And I said, computers just aren't practical. And he got me into it, pushing me and shoving me, and he convinced me of it. And I never dreamed that I would be building interrelational databases for preacher filing systems. But uh, use of computer and sermon preparation, keeping names and address, calendars, communication, it's all out there. There's so much software out there available. There's no reason why a preacher can't be organized and be on time for appointments. You got these little things right here that'll talk to you and tell you, you every time I turn this on, it says, You've got a doctor's appointment at twelve thirty today. I, I can't I can't get around it, you see. So the material is there. Now what we want to focus on is filing and retrieving information. When I got out of school, everything all my filing stuff was kept in a ledger, a written ledger under subject, author, 
I'm not going to take time to try to explain that. It was called the old Wilson topical filing system. And I utilized the aspects of that to build an interrelational database that accomplishes the same thing, but looking is with far greater speed. You can find things with great speed. Uh, before I ever began marketing this program, <clears throat> that by the way, I'm going to give to you for free. I give it to preacher students for no charge. But before I ever began marketing it, I was sitting at the table, the display here at the MSOP lectures, probably 15, maybe 16 years ago, at Tom Bright's study. I'm at Tom Bright's display, and the power lectures were right over here to my right. I was sitting on the corner. And as I was showing this to Tom, Brother Clark was standing right behind me. And he said, can you find an article on your system? And I said, tell me what it is. He said, I, I spent six hours, literally six hours, looking for this little item, one solitary life. Well, you've come across it, have you not? One solitary life. He said, I want to put that in one of my lessons. And so I ran my filing system up. I typed in the title of that in the search. Came up with four different references, three of those books he didn't have, but the fourth one was a power lecture, 2001. I didn't even get out of my chair. I just reached over and got his book, turned over to the page number, and there was what he had spent six hours looking for. Now, what if he had spent those six hours filing things away in, a, in such a manner that he could retrieve them just like I did right then? And the computer age is really uh, has really helped on this. Now, I want to talk about setting up folders very quickly on the computer, and I'm going to jump out of this for just a moment and try to show you a little something here. Uh, these are my user folders. I have my computer business, uh, which are databases that I sell. This, But here's my folder on church things. And when I opened this folder up, I had subfolders. And you'll get used to the arrangement. Fix it the way you want. Don't You don't have to follow any individual. But pick something that will keep it organized. You'll notice that I have a folder on Bible <coughs> material, bulletin articles correspondence, gospel journal articles, Hamley Church of Christ, the congregation I work with, images, lectures, I keep track of lectures by years where I'm, where I'm speaking. Here's my electronic library, by the way. Look at this material in my electronic library. Look at this. These are, these are all, well, most of these are free books. Look at this. Do you get an idea of what's available out there? I'll never read all this in a lifetime. But what I try to do is, as I read a book and put it into my regular library or my digital library, is to try to make sure I categorize things the way that they ought to be categorized. So build you some, build you some files, sub-files in your computer. And, and things that will help you to get around. I have a, a, file for, a folder for every New Testament book. Here's a book of Acts, articles, class questions, commentary, my, MS, my MSOP classes that I'm teaching on Acts, uh, sermons. Uh, but everything, you come up with some kind of an organized system to put everything into it. And do your computer the same way. I knew a preacher one time, everything was kept in this documents folder right here, everything. Correspondence, articles, sermon, everything. And when he wanted to look for something, here's what he'd do. He'd open up that documents. And you remember that page where I just showed you all the books I had? He'd start just scrolling down looking for this document. And I'd sit there, and I'm talking about thousands. It's like taking a file cabinet, and you read something, oh, that's a great article, and just shove it in there. And you got a whole page full of papers like that preacher I was telling you about, and he has no idea what's in there. And once you get so much material in there that you can't find it easily, you get discouraged in searching. You quit searching. You give up is what you do. And all that material that you have is of no value. So you need to spend time making sure that you make some folders and do the same thing with your filing cabinet as well. We'll talk about some of that in a minute. Computerized filing, spreadsheets, databases, or this minister's file system. Now... I want to just, let me, I think what I need to do now, I'm kind of sort of through with this. 
Uh, let me stop right here. I want to keep an eye on the time. Uh, we've got about t five or ten minutes. Let me see if there's any questions or thoughts you'd like to ask so far. Any additional thoughts you want on some of this information? Maybe I'm just way over y'all's head. <laughs> Did I run off and leave you? Okay, Scott? This filing system, do you have it on an external hard drive or is it on your... Well, what do I get? I get to that in a minute. And talk about the file system oh, okay. itself <coughs> but, and, and the various ways you can utilize it and use it. How many of you are Mac users? Got good news for you. Uh, I think this program will run. I had to build a special application for it, but it will run on a Mac computer that's got something like crossover. I'm working with Billy Bland right now, and I think Billy Bland said the crossover on the Mac will run any application you put on there. He put his eSword on there, he put Word Perfect on there. Seems like they're work, work running perfectly. So we're experimenting with this and if it'll work, you, you can spend $40 at this crossover website and download their software and, and utilize that. So we'll talk about that more a little bit. Somebody else had a question? I was. Okay. All right, any other thoughts? <coughs> Okay, now let me let me take just a minute. I'm going to show you my filing system and the value of this, and uh, then I'll show you the basic that I'm going to be giving to you. Now, mine is a little bit different uh, in that I have some things like my subscribers to my email, but I, I can build whatever I want in this. But I built one that's a whole lot simpler than this. But let's take books for example. Every book needs to have a number on it. If you're with the Dewey Decimal System, this will work. You just put the Dewey Decimal number. But the, what, the, what the book number does, just to keep you from getting too complicated in your book number, like one fellow said, well, I think I'll, I'll put this in as uh, uh, T for trust number 37.64 for my 64th book, dot .375 for the year I got it, dot .722. Why don't you just put number one on there? This is my first book. <laughs> you can do that. Now, the way I categorize them, the way that I do them, when I give a book number, uh, I don't see any chalk here. When I give a book number, you see the title of this, In God We Trust? If this were my first book with, that started with the letter I, this would be I-001. The reason why I use three numbers is, you know, in computer categorizing, if you put one, two, three, four, when you get to ten, when you try to put them in, in order by number, it'll go one, uh, one zero, one zero zero, and so forth. It, it won't categorize them in order. If I have another book here, Crisis of Conscience by, by uh, Raymond Franz, this, if this were my first C book, I would put C-001. If I pick up another book that starts with an I, Instrumental Music in the Church, I put I-002. So I try to come up with some way to categorize these books. Can y'all read this from back there? Let me see. No, it's mad with this. This is not. For some reason, this is not showing up like it should. Why is it not showing exactly? Maybe, maybe this other. Well, let me come back to this. I'm hoping maybe this other one will show up a little bit better. I give a, I give a number to the book. I put a title in the book, the title of the book. Under the author, I might put, like if it's an MSOP, I might put MSOP uh, 2018, um, comma, Grace uh, Under Fire. Or, or I put that in the title <coughs> anyway. I put who the publisher is, I put the date that I got the book, and I put the price that I paid for the book. And this will calculate the total value of your library for tax purposes. You can run that off, say, for insurance purposes if you need to file a claim. The insurance companies will take something like this as a report of what you had in your office in case it ever burns down. You can narrow the dates down as to dates that you that you purchased a, a book. In other words, you could say, "I just want to see between a certain time frame as to when those books were purchased." So, 
the value of your book. Keep keep the keep track of the value of your of your books, and you can print a list out. But you have a library database, and then you also have what we call a file cabinet database. And in a file cabinet, this is frustrating. Let me let me go to this. Let me go to this other database and see if it shows up any better. Steve, if you're listening in there, uh, if you can come explain to me why we're having a problem getting this on the screen to show up uh, exactly. Let me see the MS. Exactly why this is not. See, it's not capturing all of it at all. <coughs> Anybody know why that wouldn't be doing you t computer text know why this is not showing what's on here? Nobody seems to know. Can you drag it over, Brother Waycaster? I can't slide it. I don't have any capability of sliding it. Hey, there we go. I guess I do. If I take it down from the now the question is, can y'all see the the screen from there in the back? Can you see the little fields that I've got here. Can you read those? Okay, under books then. If I had a book that I was going to use, in fact, let me do one more thing, MFS Basic. I want to give you the most updated version. We'll talk about getting it and installing it here a little bit later. But this is the... Uh, you're going to you're going to be giving something. That sh this is a registration code that'll be generated that you'd have to get to me. But anyway, let's let me let me large enlarge this just enough. Okay, can everybody see that on the back? When you run the system up, you're going to have a place to enter your books. I've got a sample book here: B001, Best Weight of All, Author Stranger Two, Publisher Johnson Publishing Company. The, this is not a real book. This is just a sample. And let's suppose that I'm reading a book. All right. And as I read this, here's the MSOP lectures of, of uh, 2012. And as I'm reading this, if I come across a quote or a poem that I want to file away, I write it in the back of this. And I keep reading and I keep reading. And sometimes I just scan a lecture. So, because I can cover more time, more material that way. And if I find a, something in there that's good or a good outline, I'll write it back here. When I get through, I go to my, I go to my database and I say I'm going to enter a new book now. And this is I-003. Uh, and it is I-003. I the title of it is In God We Trust. And it is the MSOP 2012 lectures edited by Keith Moser. The publisher is sane. Value is uh, $12. Uh, the date that I acquired that was 03-12-2012. And notes, if it was a gift from someone, from someone I put it that it was a gift. And then if I ever check this out, I'll click this right here so I can keep track of what my checked out books are. Don't ever, if you're gonna loan books out, keep track of who you loan them to and get them to make an agreement they're gonna get that back to you. I've lost probably a good dozen books from people that have, uh, uh, that have just not, uh, they've not turned books back into me. Now, once I save this record, I've got the book number and record, I, now it's time for me to file. And I go back over here and I say, let's hear, here's, a, here's a good lesson right here. Let me just pick up the first one, a, a, a lesson by David Sain, the citizenship and dual, the Christian's dual citizenship. And I may want to put this under, uh, uh, let's say, um, national righteousness. Uh, the subtopic would be uh, maybe citizens title, the Christian's dual citizenship, and it's David Sane, uh, comments, it's a lecture, and the book number is I-003, 
what number did I get it, dash 003? And see how now the name of the book appears in the slot down there when there's source. It tells me where I find it at. And then I'm going to put the uh, page number, page 12. Now here's the value of this down the road. Save this and exit out of this. You decide you want to do a lesson on national righteousness. You open up your file cabinet and you do a search on everything you have. I'm going to use an asterisk, which is a wild card, national, and the only part of the word. And I want to see everything that I have that's a asterisk, poem, asterisk, or asterisk, sermon, or asterisk, um, quote. I'm, I'm looking for everything I have in that. And when I run that, if you look right down here in the corner where you can't, you can't see it right here, but let me run this, move this up just a little bit. Down here in the corner, you'll see there's 35 records that I've got. There's an article that's a quote uh, that appears in, uh, in fact, I've even attached it. I got this off the internet and I attached it into this note. I don't have to look it up. There's an article, a quote by Douglas MacArthur. There's a quote by Calvin Coolidge. There's one by James Madison. All the way down to the, uh, somewhere in here where I, where I entered what I had just entered. But it, you're going to have masses of material that you filed away. And it becomes like a, like a uh, card catalog to you. Now, let's take our break. I think it's about time. Let's take a short break. And we'll come back and we'll talk about periodicals, how you file periodicals away. And then we'll talk about how to set this up if you're interested in getting this.
In other words, Excel, uh, you essentially have, as soon as we get it up, you essentially have two spreadsheets if you're familiar with how Excel works. Let me back this off just a minute here. If you're familiar with how Excel works, you have two different two different sheets, books and subjects. And the problem is I can't interrelate these, so here's what you have to do. There is a way you can download some free software for an Excel program that gives you the ability to make a spreadsheet into a table, which is what I've done with this. And this is essentially my filing material pulled into two different spreadsheets, two, two different pages. I have, for example, the books in which I've given them a book number and then the title of the book and the author of the book, you see, and then the publisher. If it's a periodical, uh, I mean, excuse me, I put the date that I got the book and then the price that I paid for the book. And with a table, you can do a lot more detailed searches than you can with just a typical spreadsheet. For example, uh, let's say I want. Well, let me go. To the, let me go to the subjects. After you've entered the subjects, let's say I wanted to filter this one to pick up everything that has the church in it, and I want to filter this one, the author. Well, let's say comments. I want to filter everything that's got, uh, say, for example, uh, poems, and I do OK. And what that's going to do is it's going to filter this 47,000 records down to things that have the word church somewhere in the, I'm sorry, let me, i got to do one more. Let's do, let me do grace instead. Cause We'll do okay. Now this has limited me to two things, or three things. I have a thing on grace, there's a poem, and it's in my book A064 in my library. You follow me so far? So in order to find out what the book is, I'll run over to A64, and I'm just going to filter this to the, to the book number A-064. And when I do that, it shows me the name of the book. So in Herbert Lockyer's book, All the Threes in the Bible, I have a poem on grace. And I just go pull the book out and turn to the page. But see, it requires you entering all the material into whatever database you, system you use. Now, the disadvantage of Excel is I can't tie these together. And if I'm looking at my subjects database, for example, and I remove, let's remove all the filters on the subject database, and let's remove all the filters on what I'm looking for here, put it back to normal, uh, and I want to enter something, I can do control end, it'll take me down to the very last record, and then I'm ready to, I'm ready to enter another another record into that, and I can enter another record into it. It's a little cumbersome using a, a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, but if you're just now starting, you may want to go ahead and start entering information, at least into something similar to this, and I'll be glad to give you a, a copy of this for you to use, because I've already set up the tables. It's, it's difficult to do. To some extent, it's difficult to do in, in getting it ready to do that. And uh, then I'm also working on this in the Microsoft Access format, and um, it's, it's going to be essentially the same as anything else. But now, the value of an interrelational database system like this is you can jump over to your filing cabinet, do a search, and it's like looking through cards now. You just flip through it. So the databases essentially have the same, they have the same value to them. Now let me go back to this. I want to talk about a couple of other things that you may, how are you going to go about filing? Uh, let's say you're reading a periodical and you've got a really great article right here on the Book of Mormon, but inside you've got a really great article on, let's say, uh, God's grace. How, what are you going to do with this? 
Are you going to tear it open, make a copy of it, put one in a file on grace and the other in a file on Mormonism? And then as those file, little file folders stack up, they're going to become more and more cumbersome. So here's what I do. I've actually developed, and, and I'm going to go back to my, my system for just a minute here. I've actually made a book in my filing system that I call uh, C-049. And the only reason it's got this number is that when I set this up, I already had C-1 through C-48 taken. So this is just a collection of bulletins that I made. And uh, so as I read an article, and I see that article, and I like it, I want to file this one on Mormonism, this one on, say, Grace. So I go to my file cabinet under subject, I put Mormonism, under title I put, the Book of Mormon from God, and then I put uh, the author, and then I write up in the corner of this C49 number what? If this were the first one, it would be number one. If this were my thousandth, sheet C49.1000. And then I enter as the location C49.1000. And then I come in here and I pick it up, I take a, I take a folder in the cabinet, and I take an empty folder like this, and I turn this thing upside down, and I stick it in there after I file it, and then I turn this over and I put C49 number one dash, and when it gets filled up to a comfortable size, I fold it like that. This has got tons of information in it. So the articles I filed away. I put it into this right here. And then I put, put it into my file. Into my file plan. 54, 80, 50. You find out where this went. It's the last time. 50, 54, 80. So when I'm looking and I'm doing a search and I find some articles, let's say, on the church. I'm doing a lesson on the church. And I've got C49 number 5580. I go pull this down, pull out the drawer that's got 5580. I go back here to 5580. I pull it out. I pull this out. I turn page 5580, and there it is. Right at my fingertips. I can find any article in here, any article in here, in about a minute, minute and a half at the most. I put my hands up. And sometimes I find articles I don't even remember having filed away or having read. It's a process of building your own library and getting it ready to use. Uh, let me just show you the value of this. My assignment for the South Haven lectureship, is this showing up okay? Let me do a zoom on this now, maybe a little bit more. <clears throat> Y'all see that in the back? Okay, my assignment at the South Haven lectureship was the devil and his origin. And so before I go over to the library to spend time on it, I wanted to see what I had. So I do a search. There's a little search, but it looks like a pair of binoculars that you're looking for something. And I do a search, and I'm going to type in, uh, I'm going to put an asterisk for this reason. If I file something, I may have filed it away as Satan, comma, the devil, comma, uh, or a passage. I, don't, I won't remember what order I put that in. So if I do this, if I do an asterisk with Satan and then another asterisk. It's going to look for Satan no matter what's before it or what's after it. Either one. Then I can add a comma and I can do another asterisk and do devil. And then I can do another comma and I can do another search like Genesis asterisk 3 and asterisk which essentially what I'm telling the computer is, and all this, by the way, is explained in help files on this. I'm saying I want to see everything that I filed away that has to do with Satan, the devil, Genesis 3, verse 15 and following. And then I want to also look for anything in here under the title that reads origin, or perhaps even comma beginning. And then I do a... I do a search, I run the query. And you'll notice down here, I've got 14 <coughs> records. I've got this article by Burke Thompson in R6, which is Reason and Revelation. And it's in January, it's in October of 1998, and also November of 1998. 
There's an article in F10, which is Firm Foundation 1987. You see how I've entered the year there? This is the way I copied them out of my ledger years ago. I, I, this is the way I entered dates, but I entered, and it's on page 262. I go find that and I pull it out. And then I've got uh, an article by Wayne Jackson in G31, which is Great Doctrines of the Bible. I've got an article by Rex Turner on Satanology in his Systematic Theology book. I've got an article on, in F11, which is Four State Gospel News. I've got an article in Gospel Advocate, 1973. I've got an article in The Restore, 1998. I've got an article in The Origin, in uh, The Hope of Eternal Life, Bellevue Lectures. There's another one in uh, an MSOP lectureship book. Satan Diabolical Ruler. There's another one by Gary Collins. You see what I've, what I've got at my disposal? I just go get it, I pull it out, I'll lay it on the disk, and I'll get I have it to work with. Now, the database that, uh, that I provide also has a sermon outline, I mean a sermon database, where you track your sermons. I just give a, I just give a number to the sermon that's unique. I put the, the name of the sermon, the, the passage, maybe that's the text, I put some of the subjects, it could be repentance, forgiveness, any number of subjects. And where, do, where is this particular sermon? In this case, it's an old sermon that I had in hard copy in a file. And so I put file, which means it's in the file cabinet, under repentance. It's in that folder. If I ever move it out of that into this, I'll change the location of it. So uh, as you go through, you enter all your sermons, and then you put where you preached that sermon and the date you preached it. Location. What was the occasion? A.M., P.M., Wednesday night, lectureship, gospel meeting. Because later on, you're not going to remember whether you preached a sermon at any particular location. So let's say, okay, I want to see every sermon that I preached at Forest Hill. And these are the sermons that I taught at Forest Hill. Wednesday night class, uh, A.M. sermon, P.M. sermon series on Proverbs. Shows everything that I did in that here at Forest Hill because you're going to forget where you preach things the story was told one time that C.R. Nickel preached a sermon in the gospel meeting on Sunday came back Monday night preached the exact same sermon and one of the dear ladies coming out said brother Nickel did you know you preached that sermon last night and without cracking a smile he said sure was a good one wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> well you can do that if you want but uh, I prefer to try to bury my sermons from time to time so you have a file cabinet database, you have a book database, and these two are tied together by the book number, which enables your database system to tell you what book it's in. The sermons are two databases. This one, information on the sermon, and this one down here, where it's used, are tied together by sermon number. That's the internal workings on this. Which you can also, each one of these databases has a note. If you click inside the note, you can, you can actually paste sermons into this note if you want. Now this doesn't format. There's no way you can format this. So if you want to keep your sermon in here, paste it, but then copy it and paste it into a word processor when you get ready to preach it, and then, uh, then develop it a little bit. Okay. Uh, in addition, there's also address database, which will allow you to enter addresses and then actually track visits to the people that you make. So that, let's say I make a visit to this person right here on uh, 0312 and uh, memo uh, study in OBS1 and I can generate a list of studies, a list of people that I visited in a date language. And uh, it helps you to kind of keep track of, keep of what's there. All right? Passwords, I don't have a database. I'm just trying to show you some of the ones that are in, in the database system that I've developed. Now, let me, let me just kind of stop there. We talked about books. I, I gave every book a number. I filed everything back here. It's a lectureship book. I go through and I file every title by author and subject. Uh, and then I put a number on that book, put it into my database, and that goes on the shelf. And you'll be surprised how many times I'll use this. I'll have a reference to a poem or a quote. I'll pull this off. Now, uh, 
Who was that showing me the, the Mac system, how you were doing it? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. He was showing me that in his Mac system, he set a folder somewhere to mine, and that you can do a search in Mac that will look inside all of the different articles that you've got. Like say you want to see everything having to do with Abraham Lincoln. So you do this search, it's going to return everything. You're not going to be able to narrow it down and say, show me quotes by Abraham Lincoln. Show me sermon ideas on the subject of grace. That's where your general search in your computer folders is limited. And so a good database system or a means of keeping track of that will help. I file periodicals just like this right here. I've got seven drawers. In fact, I'm up to number 6,094 <coughs> on this right here. I've got 6,094. Sometimes this is just one number. This is this is number 6,094, but look at, see all the pages I've got? So I've got about a dozen entries just there. So there's probably 20, 30,000 articles listed in my database that I have access to. My full database has, I have 48,000 records now. I got my own little library, and I'll never get to all of it. Now let me stop there and see if there maybe there's some questions or thoughts just in general on filing. Um, sometimes I'm asked, how much time do you spend filing? Uh, typically I spend, in earlier years I used to spend about an hour filing every week. I usually do it on Monday morning or Friday or something. But an hour spent every week, an hour and a half spent every week. 20 years down the road is going to pay rich dividends. You won't spend that time looking for something that you can't find. And after you spent 30, 40 minutes on it, you've wasted 30, 40 minutes. So uh, some kind of a system, spreadsheet or something like this, will, will take you a while. When you log everything into your, into your catalog, uh, how do you uh, organize everything out there on your shelves or your, or your uh, or your cabinets, you do that by alphabetical or do you do this scale these, by number? These articles are put in here by, by, by number, obviously. Uh, every, every one of these, this is C49, number 5520 through 5579. So when I pull the drawer out, I can see what's in here. And I don't, from up here, I go down to the next drawer. So loose papers like this, thousands of them, hundreds of them. Uh, I've got a whole lot more just doing scans of things and putting them actually under the subject matter. Like sometimes I'll do a scan and I'll... This is one of the great things about digital. Uh, I have sermons and articles folder and you'll notice I've got all kinds of subjects in here. Uh, articles on compromise. Uh, I may have a PDF article in there, but still I'll want to go to my database system and I'll say, here's a, here's a quote on grace. It's under my C slash sermons and articles slash church. And I know where to go look in folder. And that way I can find it. The more detailed you are, the easier it's going to be to get your hands on that when it comes time to pick it up. How do you know where to file this specific? Okay, when I read an article, here's an article, Triple Down Apostasy, the Influence of Christian Colleges Among Churches of Christ. Uh, I don't read this in great detail. I look to see if there's any quotes, statistics. Sometimes it will catch my attention. I'll spend more time reading it. But what I'm trying to do is to get this file where I'll have access to it later. Because you're not going to remember even having read this. So don't spend time trying to read everything that's later. There's too much to read. But if you can file it away and use it later, that's the great value of it. So I look for quotes, I look for statistics, something catches my eye, and I read a little bit, and then when I get through, I'm going to put C49 number 6065 on this. I'm going to go to my file cabinet, I'm going to, I'm going to put under subject, I'm going to make a new entry, uh, Christian Colleges. Uh, false teachers. Uh, maybe there's a specific false teacher he's focusing on, like Rubel Shelley. I put Rubel Shelley in the subject. I go down to the title, I type the title in, I put the author, and I put statistics under comments. I put statistics, quotes, whatever it is. I go to the next article. It's also C49 number 60, 
uh, number 6,095, but it's doc two, it's the second page, third page, fourth page. So every article is filed. I don't file every article. It's not worth reading at the end. I don't take the time to file it. Go file things you don't think you're going to use. So every, everything in here is going to be filed, and then it's going to have its number. I'm going to stick it in this file right here under 1695. It's going to have a number on 1695. So that when I pull it out and I use it, when I get through, I put it in my used stack to refile all my books and papers. Pick this up. This goes to C49695. I find this. I put it back in there. Every, every week or so, I clean my office. I put books up. I put papers up that I've got laying around so that, that they're there to use. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, let me talk about getting this file and how to run it on your computer because it's a little tricky with Windows, 10, with Windows 2010. And uh, if you'll write down, and I can either give this to you on a jump stick or you can go download this from my website, but you're going to need some information. My website is called churchsoftwareplus.com. That's my website, and I have a little thing called My Store right here. And you click on that. And you go down to the bottom of this, you'll see software down here, down here at the bottom. And it's a minister's file system. It's supposed to be 2018 because I just updated it. Now, you're going to have to pay attention to this. Here's a number right here <coughs> that will temporarily <coughs> unlock this program for free use. And then later, you'll have to unlock it permanently. Now, what I'm going to do is... If you decide to get this, I'm going to show you, and you get it on your computer, I'm going to show you how to unlock it without having to send me a code and I have to respond back to you. You won't be charged anything to download this, but you go down here to the download, and when you run this, it's going to say whatever. And you're going to save this file, and it's going to download it into your download. And once this download finishes, then you just run it. And I'm going to start the run on it, but I'm not going to I'm not going to complete it because I don't want to install this runtime again. So now, once this is downloaded, MFS install, you click on it, and it's going to run the 2018 and install it. Uh, Windows protected. I'm going to run it. Maybe just lagging a little bit. <clears throat> I've never seen that, so they must have updated some safety features or something. Somebody know how to turn those? Okay, hold on a second. If I pull this down, turn this off. Give it just a second. Sometimes it lags a little bit. There, there it comes. Turn this off. Well, it's not going to run it. There's no reason. So let me take another. After you, I may have a safety feature turned on on mine. So let me just go get it directly from this and show you what it's going to do. MFS Basic 2018. When you click on that install program, it'll run it and it's going to ask you where you want to put it. And it's defaults to C drive MFS Basic is what it defaults to. And so let me stop here and I need to talk to you about running things in, in compatibility mode because uh, in order to run this program, it's got to be run compatible with Windows 20. Try to stop this for downloads. Okay. Now, when it installs the program, it installs two different things. It installs the powertrain, the Alpha 5 
uh, gets me under program. It's either under program files or, or program files 86. In this case, it's just right here. See this A5 V10. That's not even. That's just there to run it. You don't need to mess with it. But it installs the program itself. Uh, right off the C drive unless you designate other words. So what I want to do is, I want the first thing I want to do when you install this is we've got to run this in compatibility mode. And I'll give you some run up, I'll give you some information on how to do this, it's in printed form. And when you open up the powertrain, which is this right here, we right click on this Alpha 5 Execute and we do properties you can do any program you've got like this in compatibility mode. We want to run it in, tw in Windows 7 and do OK. That means now you can open the powertrain up, which is what it's about to do. No database is open, just the powertrain. Okay? And uh, at least I know now it's running OK. See all the buttons are highlighting. And uh, now I'm going to go get the actual program itself, which, by the way, one other note, when you run this, it's going to install something similar to this right here on your database. It's going to read MFS. It'll be a shortcut. I don't have one on here. But now I'm going to go get the database itself. And... Uh, that shortcut will take you to this right here, and it should run. And now you're ready to start it. And what it's gonna ask you is, I need your license code, Code, don't worry about that, I'll get it to you. Now if you're on, out there on the internet, you need to buy this, it's 19.95, but uh, it'll keep reminding you, I need a code, and now you're ready to start using this. And you'll get a warning 30 days for until we unlock it permanently, all right? And then you just start making your entries, uh, file cabinet books, and start keeping track of your material. And stay consistent, and it'll it'll help you. It'll help you. Uh, it'll pay rich dividends down the road. Okay, anything you want me to go over? We've got a little time, and I wanted to use some of this just for on on hands. Uh, let's do this. anybody have anybody want to get this and put it on your computer? and use it right now, I want to start using it. If you've got a jump drive, if you'll let me have it, I'll give you a copy of the install file and you can put it on your computer immediately and we'll start working with it. And I'll just stay around for a little while until I have to leave and I'll, I'll help you with some hands-on on that. Do y'all have access to the internet to download the file? Can y'all get to it? Someone said Bradley just loaded it. You just loaded it? Okay, don't forget you got to run it in compatibility mode. <laughs> Is it running? Yes, so far. I'm at the last. Adam, did you did you say you were running it? No. Scott, did you say you were running it? No. Who was just telling me to download it? Bradley. Oh, Bradley. Okay. Yeah. Did you get it downloaded? Okay. Yes. Okay. Did you install it? Yes. And is it running all right? No, I'm at the license number. Right. Okay. You need to, the license number it's asking for is that one on the website. Okay. That uh, so let me read this to you, and you can enter it if y'all want to write it down. You can. Um, my store. Okay, the number is six six eight nine three six seven six four one nine two. Five four zero seven, and that should unlock it temporarily. I'm gonna walk through this with Bradley real quick and let's see how it does. Okay, did that unlock it for you? It says error running. Yeah, now we need to go to compatibility. So close the program out like I'm doing here, because it won't run it. And you need to open up your browser, I mean open up your Windows Explorer and go to the C drive and let's try, see if it put it under program files under a folder called A5B10 runtime. Do you see that? Um, 
No. You see it? No. Try looking under program files C86, uh, X86. Try looking under that. Is it there? Um, no, it's not there. Folder A5B10? Oh, there, there it is. In the, uh, we, found, we found it. Okay. Now open that up. Open that A5B10 up. Bradley, and let's go down, not this one, but this one that says Alpha 5 EXE application file. You see that? You see this? Um, Take a look up here where I've got up on the board. This is under the program files A5B10. It's got a little red A beside it. And it says Alpha 5 ex Execute. You're going to right click on that. You with me? I think so. Right click on that. Does this thing with properties show up here? Properties. Down at the yes. bottom? Yes. Okay, click the properties. I had to help you. Now you see the tab that says compatibility? Um, no. See on the screen right here? Yes. Okay, you see this one that says compatibility right here? I don't have that. You don't have that? No. What do you have? <clears throat> Sure, what I have to be honest with you. <laughs> Back up to this file, find this file right here. You see it? Look up here, Bradley. You see what I'm, what I'm at? You see that file right there? Yes. Right click on it. Now, you see properties all the way down here at the bottom? Yes. Click on it, and you should get a screen that looks just like this. My screen looks like that, except I don't have a compatibility tab. It doesn't have a combat. Mm -hmm. There it is, right there. <laughs> click, click in the box under compatibility tab. I know. It, it I had a fellow call me one time. He bought my database system, and he said, "I can't get it to run." I said, uh, "Well, let's look at your properties." And he said, "How do I get to that?" And I said, "Go down to the menu bar down at the bottom. This thing down here at the bottom of the screen." I said, "Let's let's click on uh, let's click a, a, on the thing. Get the file explorer. How do I do that?" I come to find out, he said, "I'm always having problems with it. My computer is always giving me problems." And I said, "Well." If you didn't know that, he didn't even know that menu bar was there. He's, I said, how are you turning your computer off? He said, I just unplug it. <laughs> never does the shutdown. He just, um, it just never runs right. And I said, why don't you uh, let me just reimburse you for the program? <laughs> okay, under compatibility, you see that little box that says run the program in compatibility mode 4? Yes. You want to click Windows 7. And we do okay. Now, let's open this Alpha 5, execute, and open the program, the run program, make sure it opens correctly. Did it open correctly? Yes. Okay, it should show something like this, all right? Now, let's close it out and close this out and go find that little red A it put on your screen. Do you see that little red A? Yes. Let's click on it, and it should run the program. Does it? Yes. Okay. Now make, make sure the buttons operate pretty quickly. In other words, when you put your mouse, if there's a delay and it doesn't light up or it's slow, when we need to change it. Does it run okay? Yes. Okay. You're in business. And uh, I'll get I'll get that permanent unlock. In fact, I'll show you how to permanently unlock it here real quick. Uh, yes. Now, if you, if you download it now, can you switch? Laptops. Yeah, when you switch laptops, and here's a good here's a good question for this reason. This is installing the data files in a folder. Well, it's going to 
let me just make a fake folder here. It's going to you're going to go to C drive and you're going to see men file sys. I think it says 2012 or something like that. This file, this folder right here is all of your data. And I recommend that from time to time you do a right click and you send it to some jump drive for a backup. All right. This is your data file for, for a backup. You follow me so far? So if you've been working on one computer and you want to switch to another computer, you back that folder up somewhere because you're going to carry that to the other computer later. Now, after you get the next computer, you take the install file, you reinstall the whole program, go through the compatibility thing again, and then you go over here to C drive where your folder is, uh, MFS right here, and you just delete that whole folder because that's an empty database now on your new computer. You follow me? If you've installed it on your new computer, it's an empty database, right? So I'm just going to delete that whole folder, take my jump drive, and copy that jump drive right back onto this. And then your short top, your shortcut on your desktop will take you to it. Make sense to you? So if a person has to purchase that, if they purchase the uh, program the first time, <coughs> first laptop, would they have to purchase it again? No, no. You get you download it free. You'll already have the unlock key. In fact, when you put your backed up folder in there, it'll have the unlock key in the data. It'll automatically be unlocked for you. You don't have to worry. But you will have to walk through compatibility mode again. All right. Any other questions? All right. If you're interested in this and you've got a jump drive and you want to tinker with it, if you'll bring your jump drive to you, I'll put the install file on your jump drive. And then down the road, I'll get with you on how to unlock that thing permanently. If not, you can send me an email. And essentially, what you can do when you send that email, uh, if you'll just uh, database programs, uh, um, when you send that email to me, real quick, you see this light? It'll, it should produce a license code. Mine's not because it's a demo. There'll be a license code right there, and you send that to me, and I'll help you get it unlocked, or we'll do some shortcuts on it. Any got any other questions or thoughts, comments? Now, for you guys that are on Mac, as soon as I get this worked out with Billy, uh, how many of you like to run it on your Mac computer if we can get it running on? It? How many of you like to get it? And what we'll do is you'll use the same install file but you'll do it through the crossover or if you've got parallels you can do it on parallels whatever will run unfortunately i'm not familiar enough with mac systems to tell you how to maneuver that we're still trying to figure it out billy and i are on how to run it once you get it installed we won't, we won't work on that. but if all you use is a spreadsheet a ledger of some kind take time to file and it's going to take you rich dividends down the road keep your library in order Organize so we can get to things. Any questions or thoughts, comments, observations? And I'm going to give the next hour back to you. If you want to tinker with it, take a look at I'll stay around. We'll kind of hit you through some of it. Yes, some little things that come up in it. And then I'll let you or so. I've got to get to the doctors. I, I mean,